and I'd now like to uh, introduce Sam Alamalaki. He originally arrived from Iraq in 1997 as a refugee. Passionate about inclusion and diversity, his career has seen him gain expertise across the sporting, corporate, not-for-profit and NGO sectors. Sam worked as the Head of Community Engagement at Cricket Australia and was also the Secretary of the Australian Cricket Diversity Council. Over a four-year period, Sam oversaw record levels of participation, sponsorship and engagement growth, as well as a leading substantial organisational change. Currently, he is the Founder and Managing Director of Consulting Active Global and holds a number of roles on various advisory committees and councils. A self-proclaimed self sporting tragic who is presenting his strategies for success Please welcome Sam Almalaki. Thank you, Brendan, and good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you. I couldn't help but think in a swimming heat between Hall, Buchanan, and Almalaki, I'd be two metres behind before even going into the pool. Nonetheless, it's great to be up here in Queensland from Victoria. Just as you have Queensland's beautiful one day, perfect the next, in Victoria we like to think that we're marvellous one day, miserable the next. So it's good to be up here in warmer climate. Who here belongs to an organisation that wants to succeed? Please raise your hand. Keep your hand raised. You're not off the hook yet. You've got to work for this. You've got to work with me. Who here belongs to an organisation that has a strategy for success? Keep your hand up, please. Last but not least, who believes that strategy will succeed? Okay, very few hands. Nonetheless, over the next hour or so, my objective is to make sure that everyone in this room has some takeaways from this morning that, they, that you can take back to your organisation so that you can ensure your strategy sets you and your organisation up for success. And so I'll be sharing with you concepts that aren't just in theory, but have been tested from my own personal and professional experience in being involved in a number of organisations, often at either senior management levels or at a board level. I want to start off with the five P's for organisational success. What I've always believed to be the key puzzle pieces that you need to bring together to make sure that your strategy is set up for success. The first of those P's is purpose. If mission tells us the what and vision tells us the where, then purpose is the why. And often in sport and rec, particularly at the top level, what gets lost is the reason why an organisation and a team exists. And so as part of understanding and, and unveiling the purpose of your organisation, it's fundamentally a question of who are you as an organisation and what need do you fulfil in society? From there, you'll have a good sense of what your purpose is, and fundamentally, strategy needs to be driven by why you exist, so that there is consistency between your purpose and performance. The second P is priorities. Every strategy is fundamentally about articulating what's important. What matters most to your organisation? And it's about making choices. We can't do everything. We need to prioritise. And we need to prioritise what's important over what's urgent. So we must begin with the end in mind. Where are we going to land? It's got to be a strategy that's clear on the landing spot. The third P is people. Once you've worked out your purpose and your priorities, you need to start to think about who and what roles you need to have that will be critical to making sure that you deliver on your purpose and deliver on the priorities you've articulated. 
once you've resolved the people question, it then becomes a question of planning. The fourth P. We must have a rigorous planning process in place to ensure that our strategy is set for success. And well before finalising your strategy, you need to think about how are your resources going to align to the priorities that you've identified, both people and financial resources. So you need to make sure that you've got a rigorous planning process where you've tested each priority against your capacity and capability to deliver on those priorities. The fifth P, and the most important P, only second to purpose in my view, is performance. As Churchill said, however beautiful the strategy is, you should occasionally check the results. And when we're thinking about performance, we're really drilling down to our focus, to how we're going to empower our key people, in fact, all of the people that are involved in our organisation, it's about accountability. So many strategies are written up without an articulation of what success looks like. And you can't have accountability without knowing what success looks like and what are the appropriate measures you need to have in place. And what every strategy needs is momentum, and ongoing momentum beyond the strategy release. You need to keep everyone motivated. And so the fourth important aspect of performance is recognition. We must recognize progress. No matter how slow it is, progress is progress. And so when you're thinking about performance, the fifth P in this important puzzle piece, you must give thought to recognize people for the progress that's made. And everyone needs to see that recognition taking place and, and be made part of it. So they're the five Ps, or the five puzzle pieces, as I'd like to put it, for developing a strategy for success. Now, of course, every, underlying every good strategy is a good structure and a clear structure. And in, in my experience, from having developed a range of strategies and overseen their delivery, there are three important phases, if you like, to strategy development. That is development, delivery, sorry, discovery, development, and delivery. The first D, discovery, is really about information gathering. That includes identifying your key strategic issues that you're trying to address as an organisation. It's about doing a SWOT analysis of both internal and the external environment of, that your organisation exists within. It's about consultation, reaching out to your internal and external stakeholders and understanding their views, their insights. It's also about research, getting the facts together, understanding the trends, understanding the things that will likely have a significant impact on your strategy. So that's the information gathering phase, the discovery bit. The second bit is about development, the second D. And this is where co-design is so important. This is where you're putting the strategy together and where you're articulating the five P's, your purpose, your priorities, the key people that will move your priorities forward, your planning processes and the systems you'll have in place, and last but not least, how you will be a high-performing organisation. That's what development is all about. And so it's really important at this stage that your development isn't just made up of a one-day strategy workshops that involves your top tier management. Because guess what? Your strategy will only ever go as far as that workshop and that room you're in. If you want a strategy that's owned by everybody in the organisation and that it has momentum, you need to make sure you embark on a strategic development process that engages everyone so that everyone can feel part of the strategy. 
that they've contributed to what your purpose is, to what your priorities are. And so it's really important. From my experience, the strategy development process should never be done less than three months. And, my, and the usual experience I've had is it's at least six to nine months. And I know that takes a lot of time, but when you've got a strategy that's got a three or five year horizon, I'm not about meeting a, a deadline. I'm about making sure we've got it right and that everyone feels they're part of the strategy. So that's your development phase. And last but not least, we've got to make sure the rubber hits the road and that we're delivering on what we've articulated as important within our strategy. And this goes back to the fifth P I mentioned earlier of performance. This is about making sure that everyone is hyper-aligned and focused, laser-focused, on those things that you've identified as being important to the organisation. Truth be told, you'll always revisit each of those stages. What will, what will shift will be how much time you spend at, within each of those key three develop, uh, phases. So in the first year, you may be very much focused on the discovery and development of your strategy. But from about the nine-month period onwards, you're really focused on delivery. And as you reach towards the end of your strategic horizon, you'll go back and shift greater emphasis on discovery. But you must have always processes in place where you're continuously discovering, collecting the intelligence that you need to make sure that your strategy evolves and continues to be relevant to the environment you operate in. So they're the three Ds that underline any good strategy that I've been associated with. There's a worksheet, and I forgot to mention this earlier, there's a worksheet in the bag you got given this morning, I see a few people, where you can write notes, but I understand the presentation will be circulated. Look, at this point in time, I do want to pause and see if anyone has any questions, because the next part of the workshop is more focused on participation and inclusive participation. Are there any questions on the two concepts I've just shared with you? My experience is the more people you have involved in your strategy, the more likely you will have ownership across the organisation and beyond the organisation. So it's not just internal but external people. No shortcuts should be taken at any part of those three Ds. Because once you do that, particularly at a discovery stage, people are naturally going to be sceptical. And you must really mean it when you say, we're keen to hear alternative views. Because what's always been important for me, it's about getting the strategy right and getting the outcome. Not so much that my ideas or my worldview is the one that gets reflected in that strategy. So you must genuinely embark on a process of engagement. Yeah, look, most of us and most people jump straight into the doing. Uh, and so that's why each person in this room is busy. But my question is always, are we busy doing the right things? And so this is, this is not fun work. It can be for some geeks or those of us who are strategy gurus or would like to think of, us, of ourselves as such. It's not fun work. It is hard work. It requires detail. It requires active engagement and continuous thinking. But it will help make sure that you don't go through any pain down the track and that you're really driven by a sense of purpose beyond just simply attending to the urgent and just being busy. I, I, I remember at my time at Cricket Australia, my immediate team was, was frustrated with me the first month or two months about this process and the level of detail we were going and not knowing exactly where it's going to come to. What is it going to mean? And so it's really important to make sure that you're addressing people's concerns along the process and you've clearly articulated a roadmap. You might not have the answers to where you'll land and you shouldn't really if you're embarking on a proper process of discovery and development. That'll help you do that. What's important is you've mapped out the process that will underpin your strategic development process. Great question, because I know most people just want to get to the doing. The problem is they end up doing all, perhaps not necessarily all the things that are important to the organisation 
or those things that are consistent with why each of our organisations exists. Sustainable participation, and the reason I particularly use the word sustainable as opposed to growing participation, I think it's one thing to get people through the door, it's a completely different thing keeping them involved and part of your club or association and in the sport. You know, for every business, for a business to exist, it needs one thing, and that is a customer. And no different for any sporting or recreation organisation. For it to exist, it needs participants, people who want to come and play. And so when you're thinking about your sustainable participation strategy, you need to articulate clearly who your participants are and how you can serve them. The second P is really one of people. We know that our clubs and sporting organisations are only ever as strong as the people that exist within, the people who make it happen. And so you need to think about what are the critical roles that you need to have in your club or association. Articulate the key responsibilities for each of those roles and the skills and the kind of values you're looking for people to have within those roles and begin the process of making sure that you've got those people uh, in place to help you serve your participants. The third P is one of programs. What are you offering? And I know it's so, e so easy to just fall a, a pathway template that's been provided by elsewhere. But we live in a far more complex society. We all lead different lives. No longer does everyone go to church on Sunday. No longer do people, does everyone not work on, on the weekends. And so you need to constantly think about what is your offering to your participants and how do you have those pathway opportunities and flexibility within to serve your participants. So your programs become important. Not everybody's going to play cricket on a Saturday morning. But you might get them in if you offered something during the week. So always have in mind what your programs are. Place is an important part of what we do within the sport and rec environment. Got to make sure that we've got the right infrastructure in place so that we can offer those programs that we've designed for our participants. And there are a lot of opportunities and support now for infrastructure, particularly in the way of female-friendly facilities through a range of government funding. But it's more, about ha it's more than just having the world-class facilities. It's the culture within. What kind of place do you have? Is it a welcoming environment? Is it one where everyone feels included and part of something more exciting than, than what's on offer next door? Because people have got so much choice. So the environment that you offer is going to be very important. And that's not just about the physical infrastructure. It's about what's inside and the people who make the culture within. Promotion is an important part of the equation. You've got to market what you've got on offer and understand how you can reach your defined participants. In a digital world, and this is, this is difficult because this is resource intensive, we've also got to make sure we've got the right platforms to engage our participants, to make sure that our volunteers are given the support they need. So think about what platforms you can have in place to make your club, your association more professional. And professional does not mean corporatized. Professional means that you are doing your level best to do things as close to perfect as possible. People often mistake professional with corporatization, where the emphasis is really on making money for a commercial entity and having dividends for shareholders. We can all be professional. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter whether we run a grassroots sporting organization or we run a local church group or we run a national sporting organization. We should all seek to be professional in what we do. And platforms, our digital systems and our digital footprint is, import, is an important piece of that professionalization. Last but not least, partnerships. 
You know, the ask of vo on volunteers is getting tougher and tougher. There's more policies, there's more compliance requirements, there's ever greater demands from national and state sporting organisations and government without necessarily a greater level of support in all cases. And the only way we're going to be able to serve our community and fulfil our purpose and ensure that participants feel they're part of something that's inclusive and welcoming and more importantly fun is going to be on our ability to reach out to others and partner with them. There are many organisations whose purpose aligns to yours. And so you've got to find those natural synergies where you can work together and collaborate because you'll go a lot further by doing it with a whole team of people and a range of organisations with you than doing it on your own. Doing it on your own, you'll get there fast, but you won't go very far. And so this is where partnerships are critical. They're my seven Ps for inclusive, sorry, for sustainable participation. When I was at Cricket Australia, we developed a program called the Sport for All. And that was really about growing cricket's footprint into the community. If cricket was truly to be a sport for all and Australia's favourite sport, it needed to mirror the community in its entirety. And that includes people of all backgrounds, genders and socioeconomic status. And the only way we could do that is by making sure that our clubs and associations had an inclusive environment. And we developed a whole program which a key piece or part of was an education and training program as to how you can make your club and association more inclusive. Because it's one thing being diverse, our community is naturally diverse. And any club that's thriving or wants to thrive will understand that it needs, it needs to represent the community it's in. But it's one thing being diverse and it's another being inclusive. It's not just about inviting people to the party, it's making sure they're having a good time when they do come to your club or association. And there are six critical steps to becoming an inclusive club or association. The first of which is look inwards. You've got to really look, examine yourself as a club or an association and understand where are the areas that you can improve on in terms of being more inclusive and help your leaders by educating them through means by which your club can be more inclusive and welcoming. The second step, once you've built that level of awareness, we've really got to build competence and confidence amongst our volunteers and our leadership group. Nobody's got this 100%. We've all got something to learn. And sometimes it just requires that level of consciousness that whatever we're doing may be not as inclusive as we think it is. Everyone thinks, oh, you know, I'm a, good, I'm a good bloke. I make everyone feel welcome. Without necessarily realising that there are some things that we might be doing that are causing people to feel they're not part of the in club. So build that confidence and, if you like, that confidence in your leaders. The third step is you really can't be part of your community unless you know your community. Understand who makes up your co community. What is the composition? How is your community evolving? Are there young families coming in? Is it an ageing community? Is it an increasingly more recently arrived migrant community? Is it a transient community? There are many communities in regional Queensland, regional WA, where it's often a transient community, people come in and go. Fundamentally, all of those people, irrespective of their background and their life circumstances, want to have fun. They want to be part of something where they can enjoy all the things that sport offers, the fun, the camaraderie, the opportunity to just have a good time. And so you need to ask yourself, how are you fulfilling the needs of your community? And that's why it's important to know not only what your community looks like today, but what will it look like in five and ten years' time, so that you, your offering, your programs, can start to reflect the needs of the community you work in. Look outwards, partner and communicate. Once you have a good understanding of where your community is at, you really need to start to think about who you can partner with to help service your community. And there are many great organisations out there who are eager to partner with others 
so that they can go a little bit further than what their current resources allow them to. And we're all in that situation. It's not about being independent or dependent. It's about being interdependent. When we're relying on each other to, to go that little bit further than we would if we're simply on our, alone on our own or that we're merely just relying on someone else to reach where we want to go. The fifth step is one of making sure that your first engagement, when people walk through your club or association, that they're instantly made to feel welcome. So have in place a welcome officer or welcome officers at your club. You know, in any organisation, any good organisation, in, in addition to the HR person, you'd have a couple of designated staff or perhaps even a, a, a mentor who would welcome and receive and induct a new employee. It's the same in our clubs and our association. Have those welcome officers in place so that when you've got somebody coming through the door, they've instantly made a relationship or a connection with someone else within your club who can be their new buddy so that they're not just simply on their own. So that first engagement is critical. When they walk through the door, what kind of place, what kind of vibe do they get? My view is your vibe is often your tribe and so you'll start to attract those people who mirror your vibe. And so it's important to get that right. If you want to be welcoming and inclusive, you've got to get that first engagement right. The last step is really about retention and creating champions. Don't let the ball drop after that first engagement. We've got to understand that when people come to our sporting clubs and recreation centres and activities, they're fundamentally there to have a good time. They're there to have fun. There might be other drivers, including pursuing higher performance and elite sport. But fundamentally, people start out wanting to do an activity that's, that's fun and that's physical in a way that's good for their health and well-being. And so you need to constantly ask yourself, how are we retaining and keeping these people in place? And once we've done that, how do we turn them into champions for our club? Each one of you is a champion for your organisation. But every cause needs more than just one champion. It needs a team of champions. And so once you've got people glued on and coming back, they're your greatest advocates. They can start to reach out to others in the community and say, come and be part of this great organisation. So they're the six steps for inclusive participation. Any questions on those two last concepts that I've shared? The seven Ps for sustainable participation and the six steps to inclusive participation. I feel overwhelmed. Yes, I, I hear you. The key here is not one person but multiple people. And you just need to break it down in chunks by chunks. It's very easy to get overwhelmed by all of this. But I think what we all need to remind ourselves that we're never walking alone. That fundamentally it's about getting others to help us and part of a process that's bigger than just ourselves. I know that many of you operate in volunteering organisations, but the best thing and what I've always experienced with volunteers is that they're driven by a purpose and a great sense of commitment to their club or organisation. And so you need to harness that commitment you already have these people in place. It's just often about making sure that they're directed in the right area, that the focus is on the right area, then that it's not just simply being busy for the sake of being busy because seasons come and go and you, en you end up just doing the same things again and again and everyone's busy without that clarity of strategic purpose and why you exist and how you'll go about it and how you can continue to be a better organisation. What I'm about to show you is a case study that demonstrates all of these things in action from a national sporting organisation level right through to the grassroots. I was very fortunate to be part of, basically to lead the effort to set up a growing cricket for girls fund across Australia for Cricket Australia that essentially was there to support grassroots clubs and organisations develop and form girls competitions 
And this case study demonstrates grassroots people, local champions, making that national strategy happen on the ground, much to the joy of the participants and the volunteers involved. The Strikers Girls League is a newly formed competition. Uh, we have over 30 girls here today competing from across the mid-north zone. The bulk of these girls come out of the Clare Valley. It's sort of 160 k's north of Adelaide. We also have girls from Jamestown, which is another 40 minutes on, so another 100 k's on, and also Port Piri, which is you know, another 100 k's north of, uh, of Clare. There's a lot of growth opportunities in girls cricket. What we've found is that through the assistance which Cricket Australia has offered through the Growing Cricket for Girls Fund, it's enabled us to overcome a lot of those obstacles. We're trying to make it a great experience for the girls and make it easier for them to come along and play and have heaps of fun with their friends. Lucky enough, uh, Scooter has got a daughter in the pathway who's very popular amongst her peers, so I think they probably uh, can take credit for a lot of the recruitment just on the back of the right people in the right place, I think. Okay, Chloe's involvement in this has been, uh, she's been the driver, actually, to be honest with you. Uh, she, it, it really helps when you're trying to develop uh, a new concept that you have someone in the school and uh, she's in year nine and she said, come on girls, let's go and play. And the challenges were, I guess, obviously, you've got to find more volunteers. Uh, that's always a difficult task, so that's where uh, we've had to try and do a lot of volunteer engagement, which I think we've done quite well. We've got a, a large group that have come on board there. Uh, breaking stereotypes, just telling girls it's okay, you're welcome to come out. This is the new normal. Girls play cricket all over the world. There's nothing to stop you coming and being part of it. There's a huge market there. And thankfully, what Cricket Australia has done through their financial assistance has alleviated those concerns. They've helped subsidise equipment. We've had some generous people donate uh, uniforms and other things. We've actually found that it's a highly marketable product and it's got huge community interest. So now we've, we've created a really clear and precise pathway seen to um, has really engage the girls knowing that they can see where this takes them so eventually we want to try and get this uh, 30 or 35 girls up to 45 50 girls and we'll have a, uh, a really structured tournament I'd say this time next year so this is basically a pilot program there's a few little things we still need to tweak but the girls are still getting used to wearing the equipment uh, playing against the hard ball so every single game they've evolved and they're getting um, greater skill base and yeah the enjoyment factor is definitely there so this is this is the start of something very big I think. great to see strategy in action. In the first year of this Growing Cricket for Girls Fund, we supported over 50 new girls competitions across the country, including in rural and regional Queensland and all over the place. There were 350 new girls teams in year one alone. But that project took a significant period of time before it got underway. We commissioned Roy Morgan to undertake research am amongst girls who were playing cricket at the at present, but also those who weren't playing cricket but were playing other sports, and those who had played the game but weren't playing it at the current time in which the research took place. And so we did that period of discovery and understood what were some of the strategic issues that we needed to address. Then we started to develop a range of programs and strategies that we could deploy. And with the research, and some clear strategic actions with comprehensive business case around them, we're able to put the board, to the board, to the Cricket Australia board, a, a strong case for supporting local competitions like the Adelaide Strikers League. I think what that case study demonstrates for me and that whole experience of being involved in the Growing Cricket for Girls Fund is that initiatives can see their way through to success all the way down to the grassroots and local sporting organisations, not just simply at an NSO or SSO level. And that's really what's so critical and important, is making sure that that change and those strategies don't just sit on somebody's shelf in head office, but they actually have an impact and take effect at the grassroots.
Look, the good thing is there are plenty of resources to help. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are many organisations, many both at a national, state and local level, that are, that are making this happen and are succeeding. I was involved with a cricket club back in New South Wales, Kinsgrove Cricket Club. We had some 60 players back in about 2009-10. Within three, four years, the club had 300 plus players and many more volunteers, many of whom are now club presidents and serve a range of role on the committee. It does happen. And there are lots of resources and case studies on all of those sites where you can see it for yourself and perhaps learn something. And then eventually you become the champions that others look to to emulate your success. And truth be told, many of you will already have a range of success in what you do. It's about taking it the next level. There's always room for improvement and for doing things better. So I recommend checking out these resources. Of course, there's funding to help, including for participants with a Get Started voucher. It's a great initiative here by Sport and Rec Queensland. And there's also funding that I'm sure you'd be familiar with for your clubs and associations, the Get Going Clubs. So in summarising, and before we come to some questions to conclude this morning's presentation, I think the most important thing you can do, and I know it's easy to be overwhelmed, is to get moving on making sure that your strategy is, set, is setting you up as an organisation for success. It was somewhat frightening, but not surprising, to see the very few hands up when I asked the question, how many of you believe that your organisation's strategy will succeed? We can't accept that reality. We've got to change it. And so the best way to do it is by, by making a move. Don't wait for anyone else. You can make the move. And the key thing is not to be deterred. There'll be obstacles. There'll be challenges. There'll be many people who'll tell you why you can't make this happen. And so what we need to do is to get moving, to keep moving, once we've started initiating the process of making sure we've got a strategy for success. Last but not least, monitor, review, and pivot when you need to. Your strategy is not static. It's an, itera it's an iterative document. And it's constantly evolving. And pivot as circumstances change. You might have some key people leave you. The organisation needs to continue. You might have change in external circumstances. There might be some different expectations on you as a club or as an association from your state sporting organisation. Always be ready to pivot. And don't necessarily wait for others to give you the signs and the clues for why you should pivot. Sometimes you need to take the proactive step of evolving your strategy and making sure it reflects the circumstances in which you operate in. And last but not least, whether you're a participant or you're an administrator, fundamentally you're involved in sport because you want to have fun. And the only way we can have fun is by celebrating the progress we make, whether it's on the field or off the field. And so that's my real and final challenge to you today, is really take the opportunity to enjoy your progress and to celebrate each other's success. Thank you very much. I'll now take some questions. Uh, from, from your experience, what are the key themes that the successful clubs yeah, from all sports are doing to be more inclusive, um, you know, that, are gro that are growing in like diverse communities and stuff like that? Yeah, great question. Firstly, an awareness that they need to be more inclusive and welcoming, yeah? So I think, you know, the first step to solving any problem is acknowledging that you've actually got a problem or that you can do something better. And so those clubs who might not be certain about the answers and how they can address the problem, but actually acknowledge that they've got a problem, are the ones who are more likely to succeed than not. Because when, you, when you've come to that stage, when you've reached that stage, then it's about a process of getting the answers to how you can address that problem. So they have great awareness. The second thing is they have people who are genuinely committed, not to themselves, but to the club and the organisation. There are so many clubs that I see that simply their existence revolves around one or two people. And those clubs don't go very far in my view. It's the clubs who have many people who, who realise that their club 
is far more important than their, own, than their own individual pursuits and motivations. And so really it's about having quality people who say, we actually do want to grow the club, who don't just say it, but actually do everything that they can to make sure that they are a growing club that's offering sustainable participation. They're the two things, an acknowledgement that you've got a problem, and if, you, if, you don't, if you're not quite aware of what the problem looks like, get somebody from the outside to look in, and two, that you've got people who are committed to the club beyond themselves. This is not an ego trip for them. This is about the club's sustainability or the organisation's sustainability. Great question. And you've got people at Mark Fields do all the other, put nets up, do everything. They'll do all that stuff. They'll, they'll run yes. canteens. But they don't have that skill set to put strategies and policies and things in place. And you're relying on volunteers. Who do you go to for assistance when your club hasn't got the funding to go and pay for consultants and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, was, again, excellent question. I was going to say my email is up there, but in all truth, you need to... This is where, in my view, state sporting organisations have an important, play to, to, an important role to play. You really need to reach out to your regional development manager. I know, for example, in cricket, in rugby, it's the same. Rugby league, it's the same. There's plenty of people out and about who can provide that, that support. So reach out to other organisations, including your, your state sporting organisation, to give you that expertise. I mean, that's why these people get paid. Fundamentally, they're meant to be professionals who do this, who offer specialist expertise. And one of those things is about putting strategies in place. I totally get it. This would be overwhelming for many sporting clubs at the grassroots. It's also not necessarily why people join. They don't want to be in a strategy workshop. They don't want to be developing a strategy. They just want to have a good time for them, their kids, etc., to enjoy it. So reach out to other people who can simplify this for you and can provide that expertise. And the best way to start is my regional cricket or regional development manager, whatever your sport or recreation may be. This presentation will also be shared, so you've got a point of reference there and a framework to work by. And you'll do it at a level that's generally reflective of what your club and association is comfortable with. So don't, don't be fixated on about getting it perfect from the first go. It's actually just about having a process in place and a framework, which is what I've done this morning, that helps guide you as you go up and embark on this process. It's, everyone's fantastically encouraged with the growth in female sport. Yes. The biggest issue that we've got in AFL, in the Redlands, we've had a 25% increase in players yes. based off female. So we've got 100 new players into our organisation this year, which is fantastic. It is. The facilities haven't changed for 10 years. Yeah. We're expecting girls and boys to share facilities, and we're talking from... Yeah. Under sixes through to senior teams. Yeah. Planning is important. Everyone knew about this. Yes. Everyone knew that there'd be a reasonably good uptake. But now we're right behind the eight ball. Yeah. Who's responsible? Where do government, um, organisations, sporting bodies, what can we now do as volunteers? Mm to actually help and push that along the way? Yeah. Firstly, I'll start by saying you've got a great problem uh, in that you've got that level of interest and uptake. So that's fantastic. Uh, my, from my experience, I guess, in this area, really it's the relationship that the club has with the key decision makers. And that includes, again, your state sporting organisation. But the biggest sponsor of sport in this country is local government. And so I'd be asking you, what conversations have you had with your local council, your local mayor? I mean, at the end of the day, they, want, they will want a piece of your success because it means their re-election and it means more rate pays. So it's up to you to reach out and to make them aware of, the, of what a great problem you have. You haven't got enough facilities for the people that you've got cut, turning up to be part of your club. Then that local government or local council, a good local government and council, will begin to support you in building the case and advocating your cause to other key decision makers, state government, your federal MP. You've really got to get to decision makers. 
Uh, and, and your first point of call is really your local council who own the facilities. The other thing is I think people knew that there was a greater focus on female participation, but I think many people have been caught out by the response and the uptake. And so it's one thing to know something is coming, it's another to know what impact it's going to have on you and to what extent is it coming and how fast. Uh, everyone will tell you there's a lot of shifts in technology, but very few people can tell you how quickly those shifts will take place and in what form and what does that actually mean for everyday people. So it's constantly really playing out those scenarios. When you do your ongoing strategy development, one of the pieces that's critical to discovery is mapping out scenarios that may not happen or take place, but actually just turning your mind. What happens if we had 100 new girls turn up to our club tomorrow? How would we uh, manage that situation? Again, this is another kind of situation where you're focused on the important, not necessarily the urgent. So always play out those scenarios in your mind. What happens if you've got a critical incident at your club? How are you going to respond to it? And so every now and then in, on your agenda, just have a scenario, a complete hypothetical. It might never happen, but the fact that you've turned your mind to it, you'll be better prepared for when it might take place. Thanks. Yeah, I'm uh, from a four-wheel drive club here, based here in Brisbane, and one of our biggest problems we're having is uh, there's a lot of Facebook groups yeah. that are out there. Uh, we have a membership that you pay, whereas the Facebook groups you don't. So a lot of people would rather go to these Facebook groups, but they don't offer anything. We offer a lot of stuff. So we're trying to market ourselves to get more people to join an associated four-wheel drive club it's based, that is under the Queensland four-wheel drive and Australia four-wheel drive. So the question is, how are we going to keep fending off the Facebook mob? Yeah, I'm, I'm, great question. I'm, I'm not privy to all the detail and I'm not sure what's, what's your point of distinction, what's your unique value proposition to the Facebook pages. I mean, at the end well, of the day, if you've got a good offering, my view is people will come to you. And well, so see, you need to think about what is, what is taking place or what's being offered on Facebook and how you can perhaps position yourself differently to make sure you've got a more compelling offer. I mean, that's what it'll ultimately come down to. People are so spoilt by choice. In fact, we've got so much choice, we're indecisive, right? So you need to start to think about what, it, what is it that you're offering and how you can attract those people who are going elsewhere. Uh, and if you haven't got the answer, you need to keep thinking and making sure you do come up with an answer because there's always going to be competition that will uh, take those people in. Well, one thing we do offer is driver training, which you can actually operate your vehicle in a proper manner and recovery, whereas you probably heard people have been killed by uh, recovery gear and that's just because they don't know what they're doing, whereas yeah. with our training we're actually putting that out there. So I would amplify those examples so people are aware that if they go down this path, there's a consequence and that you're actually offering something that addresses what may be a serious issue or problem for them. So you need to amplify the downfalls of your competition in a very sportsmanship-like manner, <laughs> right? Not calling them out, but saying simply, if you go down this path, here are the consequences or here's what you're likely to get. By comparison, here's what we offer. Now, I'd still use Facebook and digital, um, even though I'm not on any of these platforms other than LinkedIn, I'd still use those platforms to get out to people but fundamentally bring them back into your club and your organisation. So whatever you think are the downfalls of your competition, amplify that, but more importantly, focus on your competitive edge. What is it that you do better than your competition? Yeah, so, so turn turn their weakness into your strength and amplify your strength. And hopefully that gets people coming to you. All right, look, thank you very much for your time. It's been great to be here with you. I hope you've got something out of the presentation and that it will make a difference to your club and organisation. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thanks very much, Stan.